This is the third in a series of messages called Taking the Risk to Point People to Jesus. Uh, We estimate there are 2.4 million people who live in Portland. I estimate out of those, 1.92 million are not followers of Christ. We're making inroads in reaching them and in reaching people around the world. Conservative estimates are that 100,000 people become Christians every day. That's 36, 37 million per year. How can we become part of this great adventure of pointing people to Jesus? The best way to point people to Jesus is by sharing your story. What was your life like before you met Christ? Uh, What led to you considering Christ? Uh, And then how did you actually become a follower of Christ? And then what changes have happened in your life since then? Uh, So far in this series, I've shared with you four stories. I shared the story of Levi also known as Matthew, one of Jesus' 12 disciples. He became a follower of Christ, and then he invited many of uh, his tax collector friends, notorious sinners, to follow Christ. I shared with you a story of a man who was possessed by a number of demons in Decapolis. That's the east side of the Sea of Galilee. And we believe through his influence, he brought most of the people of the 4,000 men, plus their wives and families, to uh, when Jesus went to Decapolis and he fed the 4,000. And then I shared the woman, uh, story of the woman from Samaria. She met Christ, and then she told many of her friends in Samaria. And then lastly, I shared with you my story, how in high school I began to get more open with other people that I was a Christian, and every Sunday night I would invite uh, friends to, to go with me to my uh, church youth group, Every Monday night, I would uh, fill up my car and take uh, friends from my high school to the Young Life Club. And then at the end of my junior year, I had the privilege of inviting 10 of my friends to go to Malibu, uh, Canada, uh, Young Life's camp there in Malibu. And on the last night, the leader asked if anybody had given their life to Christ, would you please stand? And all 10 of them stood Helping people come to know Jesus Christ has been the greatest adventure in my life. The only things that would even compete with it are my, my marriage to Jory and my uh, being a father to nine children. I believe taking the risk to point people to Jesus is the greatest adventure in the world. Why? I can think of three reasons. One, taking the risk to point people to Jesus is the right thing to do. If you'd like to follow along in the text we're going to look at today in the Bibles under the seats, and they're, uh, they're, they're, should be under every seat in the house except the ones on the ends, by the way, and uh, uh, it's on page 369. Sometime later, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, think Syria, mobilized his entire army and marched up and laid siege to Samaria. So they laid, you know, they, the, the city was under siege. No food or water could get in or out. There was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver and a quarter of a cab of seed pods for five shekels. They blocked off all food getting into the town, and so it's like they had no food. Uh, Think of uh, going into a store today, and there's no food in Portland. The shelves are empty, so you have to pay like $50 for a loaf of bread. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried to him, Help me, my lord, the king. The king replied, If the Lord does not help you, where can I get help for you? From the threshing floor, the wine press? Then he asked her, What's the matter? She answered, this woman said to me, give up your son so we may eat him today, and tomorrow we'll eat my son. So we cooked my son and ate him. The next day I said to her, give up your son so we may eat him, but she had hidden him. When the king heard the woman's word, he tore his robes, and as he went along the wall, the people looked, and they saw that under his robes he had sackcloth on his body. Things were so bad, people were turning to cannibalism. He said, may God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if the head of Elisha, son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. Elisha was the prophet. He blamed the prophet that all this was happening. We do the same thing today. Something bad happens to you, you're likely to blame God. 
Now Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. <clears throat> the king sent a messenger ahead, but before he arrived, Elisha said to the elders, Don't you see how this murderer is sending, sending someone to cut off my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold it shut against him. Is not the sound of his master's footsteps behind him? While he was still talking to them, the messenger came down to them. The king said, This disaster is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Elisha replied, Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, a sea of the finest flour will sell for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Uh, the, uh, there was now, he said, in 24 hours, there's going to be so much food in Samaria that prices are going to just bottom out. And now you go into the store, there's so much food you can buy bread for 50 cents. The officer on whose arm the king was leaning said to the man of God, Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of heaven, could this happen? You will see it with your own eyes, answered Elisha, but you will not eat any of it. He says, You'll see the prices drop and all the food flood into the city, but you aren't going to see it because you're going to die. Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, Why stay here until we die? If we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there, and we will die. And if we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans, the Syrians, and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. Now, it's bad enough to be a leper. It's even worse to be a leper in a time of famine. It's still worse to be a leper in a time of famine when you're in the middle of a war. And it's worse yet to be a leper in a time of famine in the middle of a war when your side is losing. There are four lepers who have been forgotten and abandoned by their people, the people of Israel. Four lepers whose bodies are being destroyed by an incurable disease. But their minds are still sharp, sharp enough to understand their options. They could stay where they were, outside the city, and die. They could try to get into the city if they would even let them as lepers, and they would die. They had no food. Or they could go over to the Syrians. Maybe they would be merciful to them and give them food to eat. Now, of all the options they had, it turns out the only one that had any hope of success was the one with the most risk. But that's what they chose to do. At dusk, they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the camp, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. They left everything. They left their iPhones, their jewelry, their HD flat screen TVs. They left it all. The men who had leprosy uh, reached the edge of the camp, entered one of the tents, and ate and drank. Then they took silver, gold, and clothes, went off and hid them. They returned, entered another tent, and took some things from it and hid them also. So they're going from tent to tent, they're eating, they're drinking, and then they're taking uh, gold and silver and, and, and clothing and they're hiding it. Then they said to each other, what we're doing is not right. This is the day of good news and we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace. As they were stuffing themselves, going from tent to tent, all of a sudden they looked at each other and said, you know, what we're doing is not right. We need to go tell the king and the people. So they went and called out to the city gatekeepers and told them, we went into the Aramean camp and no one was there. Not a sound of anyone, only tethered horses and donkeys. And the tents left just as they were. The gatekeepers shouted the news and it was reported within the palace. The king got up in the night and said to his officers, I will tell you what the Arameans have done to us. They know we're starving. So they've left the camp to hide in the countryside, thinking they will surely come out. Then they will take us alive and get into the city. The king says, this is a trap. 
if, if we go over there, then they're going to kill us. And then they're going to destroy our city. One of his officers answered, Have some men take five of the horses that are left in the city. Their plight will be like that of all the Israelites left here. Yes, they will only be like all these Israelites who are doomed. So let us send them to find out what happened. So they selected two chariots with their horses. And the king sent them after the Aramean army. He commanded the drivers, Go find out what has happened. They followed them as far as the Jordan. They found the whole road strewn with clothing and equipment the Arameans had thrown away in their headlong flight. So the messengers returned and reported to the king. Then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans. So a sea of the finest flour sold for a shekel, and two seas of barley sold for a shekel, as the Lord had said. Now the king had put the officer on whose arm he leaned in charge of the gate, and the people trampled him in the gateway, and he died just as the man of God had foretold when the king came down to his house. So the captain is king, just as Elisha prophesied. The people stream in, and the lepers watch them as they eat and drink, and they get all that they want because they told them. I love how four lepers who had every reason not to care a bit about the Israelites who had abandoned them Realized that to hide what they had found, to hoard what they had been freely given, would be the greatest crime. We too have provision. Salvation, if we've given our lives to Christ, forgiveness of our sins, guidance, God's presence. Apostle Peter said in uh, uh, Second Peter that, that Chris preached on this summer, um, his divine power has given us all that we need for life and godliness. According to our knowledge of Him, who has called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us very great and precious promises. So that we may experience the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. Peter says, when you give your life to Christ, you have His divine nature comes and lives within you. You have His power. Why would we keep that from other people? I believe Christ's life makes life better for everyone in the world. When I talk to people about Christ, I don't say, I want to tell you about something that's going to destroy, ruin your life. I say, it's going to make your life better. Sometimes they respond, how can my life be better? It's pretty good. I say, well, you could be forgiven of every bad thing you've ever done. You could know that when you die that you're going to go to be with God in heaven. You could have His guidance so that you have, make better decisions. You could have His presence in your life so you don't have to fall to every sin that comes across your path. And you could have that right now. Does that sound good? Yeah. And they will thank you for the rest of their lives. My junior year in college, I was asked to be the young life leader of Beaverton High School. And uh, God blessed that young life club. Uh, we started with 20 kids, and by the end of the year, we had 150 kids coming every week. It was so exciting. We got to the end of the year, and... Uh, we had the opportunity to take kids to camp, and uh, it was kind of run like a lottery system in those days. I think they had about 16 Young Life clubs in the Portland area, and each one would get so many spots, and I was fighting for every spot I could get because we had all these kids. And I think we got 16 spots. That's all I could get. And uh, so we took eight guys and eight girls, and uh, in the course of the week, I had the uh, privilege of talking to every one of those eight guys and they all gave their lives to Christ. Most of the kids, the kids that we took didn't know Christ. And uh, the last night the speaker stood up. Sa the same thing that happened to me four years earlier when I was a junior in high school. And, and I looked around the room and he, he said, if any of you have given your life to Christ this week, why don't you stand up and go public? And I looked around, all eight of the guys were standing and most of the girls we brought were standing. And, and just like I'd done four years ago, I began to cry. I said, God, this is so amazing. I said, God, if you keep doing that, I'll keep doing this. You change people's lives, and I'll bring them. I'll try to bring them to where they can hear about you. 
Taking the risk to point people to Jesus is the greatest adventure in the world. Two, taking the risk to point people to Jesus is the greatest adventure because it helps us grow in our faith. When I started sharing about Jesus with my friends, it caused me to grow because they began to ask questions and I, I didn't know the answer to them. So it forced me to, to read and to, to read my Bible. Apostle Peter says, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the, to give the reason for the hope that you have. If we're to be ready to answer questions people have like, why does God allow so much suffering and evil in the world? That's the number one objection people have to Christian faith. I just don't, I don't think there could be a God that would allow this mess. Or how do we know if the stories we read about Jesus in the Bible are true? We have to read our Bibles and investigate our faith if we're going to be able to answer the questions of people who are searching. You may be thinking, to grow this year, I need deeper preaching. I need a deeper Bible study. But I'll tell you, if you want to grow, the greatest thing you can do is to share your faith in Jesus with other people. To be asked questions you don't know the answers to will force you to get into the Bible. To be in an experience and somebody asks you something and you say, Holy Spirit, I don't have a clue what to say. And have the Holy Spirit lead you to, to say things that you didn't even know you remembered. You'll grow faster in that situation than from any class you can attend. To be aware that people are searching, we have to be good listeners. If we're good at listening, we'll pick up clues that people may be open to talking about Jesus or an invitation to church. When you hear a person say things like, things aren't going very well, or I'm not prepared for this, or I'm not from around here, we're new to the area, those are clues that a person may be open to hearing about Jesus or an invitation to church. When someone is, church, uh, is searching and I'm trying to explain to them what faith in Christ involves, uh, one illustration I've, I've used more than any other. I take a piece of paper and I put God at the top. I say, here's God in heaven. And then I put my name and the name of the person I'm talking to at the bottom. I say, there are two ways to get to God. One is spelled D-O. And I draw a ladder up the side of the page and I say, this is what most people do. They're trying to do something to earn their way to God, to earn His favor. They're climbing a ladder, seeing how good they can be, how much they can do in hopes that God will say, you know what, you did a good job, I'll let you into heaven. And then I say, you know, about 20 years ago, Billy Graham was in town, and he spoke about, in one of his messages, about his sin. And then in 1994, Jory and I went to Washington, D.C. for the National Prayer Breakfast, and Mother Teresa was the speaker. And in the middle of her talk, she talked about her sin. I'm saying, you know, if, if, if Billy Graham and Mother Teresa were to, to say how high they're on the ladder, I'm guessing they probably wouldn't put themselves any higher than 66% of the way up. So where would you put yourself? Now, I only talk to people that are really smart, and I've never had anybody put themselves above, their, above Billy and Teresa. I say, ooh. That's where they are. I guess, I guess I'm down here, 60 or lower. And then they see how far short they are of the 100% that God requires. God can't live with sin. So we have to be perfectly holy to come into His presence. And so they can see this whole D.O. thing not working for me. I said, there's another way to get to God. It's spelled D-O-N-E. And I draw up a picture of a cross. I said, Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine. And it's done. He finished the job. Now all we have to do is say, Jesus, the D.O. thing's not going to work for me. I need the done deal. Would you come into my life, forgive my sin? And we can begin to have a relationship with God. And then we gain access into his presence. Apostle Paul says, He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, 
but because of His mercy. As you find ways to explain your faith in Christ to your spouse, your parents, your children, your co-workers, your classmates, your uh, neighbors, you will grow in your faith. If you feel like you need to grow more in your faith, so you can explain your faith to other people, then I would encourage you to come to Alpha. Uh, that's going to start a, a week from tonight, 10-week series, and uh, you will grow in your faith for sure. Three, taking the risk to point people to Jesus is the greatest adventure because we become representatives for Christ. One of the coolest things about our faith is that we believe God doesn't reach people just through dreams or miracles, like healing people. He does that. Many people are reached uh, through those. A lot, of, a lot of Muslims today are being reached in that way. But the greatest way God reaches people is through His representatives, through His people, through us. God sent the Apostle Paul to be His representative to establish churches. One place he established a church was a city called Corinth. Many scholars liken Corinth to Las Vegas. Uh, In fact, in in, uh, Paul's day, it was referred to as Sin City. The word Corinthianize meant to corrupt a person. People went to Corinth to party. You could say what happened in Corinth stayed in Corinth. (laughs) Paul writes to the new believers in Corinth and says, Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. He said, your past is done. You're a new person in Christ. They thought, wow. Then he went on. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And the Corinthians are thinking, are you kidding me? After my checkered past, God's going to use me to reach other people? And that's the way the Christian faith has grown from the original 12 followers of Christ to 2.4 billion people today. People who came to know Christ shared Him with their families, their friends, their teammates, their co-workers. In Acts 13, we read an unbelievable account. Paul is speaking. He says, Through Him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. When the people in Pisidian Antioch heard Paul say this, they were stunned. They had never heard anything like this before. All they'd ever heard is about how to reach God was spelled D-O. And Paul was saying, no, that's not the way to God. The way to God is D-O-N-E. Christ died on the cross for all our sins. It's done. Verse 42, as Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Now, here's what we know about this city. We estimate there were 50,000 people who lived there in Paul's time. We think only the synagogue probably only held 200 people. That means the 200 went out and got 250 people each to come back if the whole city, 50,000, came the next week. They had to hold the event in another arena. That would be like us getting so amped up today when I tell you, hey, I'm starting a new series next week, Christianity 101, the best time to invite a friend is the beginning of a series. And we get so excited that we each go out and get 250 people. We show up with 50,000 next week, enough to fill the Rose Garden two and a half times. When you and I represent Jesus With the people that we cross paths with during the week, we can draw diagrams like do and done, but most people would rather hear your story than see a diagram. Tell them what your life was like before you met Christ. 
Tell them what caused you to think about wanting to follow Christ. And then how you actually came to commit your life to Christ. And then what changes have occurred in your life since then. Don't overstate the changes. Your story will be the most powerful thing you can share to point people to Jesus. One reason people don't take the risk to point people to Jesus is they feel like they don't have a story to tell. They don't know what their story is. So stop. Write down your story. Would you take out your program inside? There's a sheet that says, My Story. I'd like you to pull that out. A little harder for me to pull things out with one hand. Do you know that? My story. I'd like you to take a pen. There should be pens under all the seats in the house, except the end ones. Jot down what your life was like before you met Christ. I want you to do this right now. So actually, take a pen. You don't have to write it out, but just take some notes. What, okay, what was going on before you met Christ? Then what led me to seek Christ? Jot down, what, were, were there some things that happened to, that made you curious? Then how I came to faith in Christ, okay, what happened? Who helped me? And what changes Christ has made in my life? All right, how, how do you feel like you're a better person now than before you knew Christ? Jot stuff down. So I, I want to give you just a minute to do that. This is the third opportunity we've given you. The first was in the journal. If you're following the, the journals with us, uh, two weeks ago, uh, we were asked to write down our story. Then two weeks ago, I gave you an opportunity like this to write down your story on a piece of paper I put in the program, and now here today. Uh, I'm serious about it. When I do something three times, you know I mean it. This is important. I'm not going to give you much more time, but I, I want you just to, uh, to write down your story. When you hear someone's story, what God has done in their lives, it's exciting. So you can keep working on your story, but I want you to hear one person's story. Rachel Nichols was uh, baptized, I'm going to say, nine months ago. And we always ask people to share their story when they are, and she shared her story. But here's a little fuller version of her story. Um, my name is Rachel Nichols. Uh, I am a member here at Portland Community Church. We've been here for about a year now. Um, married to Matt Nichols, and my children are Brooklyn Nichols, who's 13, Matthew, who's 12, and our little Ashlyn, who's 6. Uh, my mom was um, born in Africa. She was a missionary kid, uh, always knowing Christ, so I was raised knowing Jesus. And um, my grandparents would come to visit during the summer, would take me to vacation Bible school. I believe the first time I accepted Christ was when I was 8 years old, um, not really remembering why, but I remember praying that he would come into my heart, and um, I don't know that I was really changed after that, but um, in first grade, uh, my parents um, had a great idea to travel the world, uh, wanted to show me the world uh, with them, and uh, took me out of school. We traveled all over. Um, during that time, I was able to see different cultures, um, able to see how po what poverty looked like, and also um, developed really strong um, bond with both my parents. My freshman year of high school, I started out uh, in a public high school. I did really well. I had straight A's as an honor student. Um, by the end of my sophomore year, I um, was trying to be cool, pleasing people, and um, ended up skipping class. My parents found out about that. And uh, it wasn't long after that my dad was walking me to my first class and um, picking me up after school, embarrassing me by talking to all of my teachers. And uh, when I got home, I had to stay home. I didn't have friends. My dad would remember him answering the phone saying, um, Rachel can't come to the phone right now. She doesn't have friends anymore. So it was after that I realized something wasn't working. Something wasn't right. Um, um, my mom called the admission secretary, Miss Nichols, who is now my mother-in-law, and she hesitantly accepted me into Portland Christian. Um, first day of my junior year, a student body was out greeting everybody. 
I remember I was warned about one person. It was the student body president, Matt. And um, he shook my hand, and I remembered I, I wanted to be careful of, of him. Um, after that, um, I, I realized that everyone there was different, different than who I had been friends with before. There was a different peace and a different a different joy and a different feeling, a vibe that was just different. And um, I came to realize that was Christ. That was people that had a purpose, that had a reason for why they did things. We enjoyed things like hiking and um, playing outside, doing things that were just fun, good things. That um, Anyway, I, I ended up coming to Christ at uh, the end of my junior year where I really meant it, where I accepted Christ into my heart. And uh, my high school years were, were amazing. They were some of the best years um, of my life. From there, I decided to go uh, to school up in Canada, Trinity Western University. My freshman year of college up there, my, my parents ended up um, divorcing. And for me, that was a really hard thing because my parents were my world. Like, it was the three of us. We did everything together and and I thought how can there be how can there be a God like how how is there a loving God who allows this to happen and um, I felt very alone I felt very alone like no one could understand me understand what I was going through during this time I um, my end of my sophomore year I believe in school um, I went to visit my really good friend Sarah and her parents were Kevin and Julie Nichols and I remember going to her house and talking to her and saying, um, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm, this is a really hard time in my life, and I, I'm struggling. And um, Anyway, so we had talked, and I, at that point, was back home from school. And um, so Matt, um, who's now my husband, he um, went up and as he was leaving back to school, he put a note on my windshield and just said, um, if you ever want to get together, um, he, I, would, I would love to get together with you sometime. It wasn't long after we had been dating, maybe a few months, that um, Matt went on a missions trip with his dad. And he was praying about whether um, he should pursue this relationship with me. I had burdens, I had baggage, I had um, all these things in my life that I was struggling with. And he prayed about it uh, wholeheartedly, saying, "Is this? if this isn't somebody you want in my life, Lord, let me know. Otherwise, let, us, let this just be a clean break so we're not wasting, wasting time here. And as he was praying, and this is his story, I'll have to share it at some point, but... Um, blank wedding invitations started rolling down the beach off the bluff as he describes it and he picked one up and he saw blank blank wedding invitation so he said at that point he knew he knew I was the the one um, regardless of of my faults of everything that um, everything that I came with (sighs) so um at that point, Matt and I got married, and um, I knew that that there that God still loved me, that He was still there, and that I was His child, and, and no matter what, He was taking care of me. And I knew, looking back, that He had a plan the whole way through; that He knew exactly what He was doing. One thing that's always stuck out in my mind is the Corey Ten Boom, where she says that even when our suffering and pain is great, they are deep that God is deeper still, like he is deeper than our deepest hurt and our deepest pain, even the depth of what I thought was the most pain I'd ever experienced. And God was deeper and he knew and he went through it with me. He, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't, he was acquainted with sorrow and suffering and he knew and he knew it even greater. This last year, I rededicated my life to Christ. I've always had problems with anxiety and fear, um, even th- throughout the beginning of our marriage, and just fear of abandonment, like, you're just going to leave me somehow. Like, I, I deserve to be left. I'm, I'm not worthy of that 
um, of that love. I'm finally at a place in my life now where I can say without a doubt that I know God has welcomed me back just like the prodigal son. I am welcomed back into his, into his family. And looking back what I've learned through all the circumstances and trials, um, that God was there through every step. He used the divorce in my life to give me a greater appreciation of marriage, of the importance of a family. The Lord used Matt and used him in a way to bring me back to him and that he loved me so much that he, he used my husband as an instrument of, um, of bringing me back to himself. Isn't it exciting to hear people's stories? It's power, powerful to be able to share your own. Do you know your story? So that if someone was talking to you, you would know what to say? Or do you just kind of, are you, are you willing to take the risk to share your story with people? Or do you just kind of keep your head down and keep to yourself? Because our culture says, you know, let's just talk about faith. Is that really how you want to spend the rest of your only life? I think you want to take the risk. Someday you want to get to heaven. You don't want, you don't want to find that your son didn't make it. Or your parent. Or your spouse. Or your best friend. Jesus invites you to be part of the greatest adventure on earth, the redemption of the world. You either give yourself to this greatest adventure or you give yourself to a lesser adventure. We all give ourselves to something. So take out your my story thing again. Bottom line says, who am I willing to take a risk on? Would you take a pen? And write a name on there. Somebody that you say, well, yeah, pretty sure he doesn't know Christ. And you're willing to take a risk on her. Maybe it's a family member. Friend, co-worker, classmate. You could put more than one. Taking the risk to point people to... Jesus is the greatest adventure in the world. Great way to start this year is to say, you know what, God? I'm willing to take the risk to point people to Jesus because I know it's the right thing to do. I know it will help me grow in my faith. And I know it's a privilege to be your representative in the world. So I commit to taking the risk this year. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you give us the privilege, if we've committed our lives to you, your son Jesus, to take that message to other people. And we want to commit to doing that this year. This year, maybe more than ever before. I want to give you a moment now to just talk to God. If you've never given your life to Christ, you could do it right now and say, Jesus, I want the D-O-N-E plan. Thank you for dying for me, Lord Jesus. Would you come into my life? Forgive me my sin. Or if you've given your life to Christ, why don't you tell him today that you want to take the risk to point other people to Jesus, people in your life. There's got to be a lot. Would you pray that right now? You pray silently.
All right, with every head bowed and all the eyes shut, I want to ask you if you feel motivated by God, convicted by God this year, that you say, I want to take the risk. I want to be part of this great adventure and share Christ with people I know in my life. Would you just slip to your feet? I want your eyes closed because I don't want you to be affected by what other people are doing. You stand if you say, I want in. I want to be part of the great adventure. So I've been talking, you've been thinking of people in your life, maybe family members, people that you know you need to be praying for. You say, I won't pray for them this year. I'll invite people to something here at church or church service. I want to share my story. I'm willing to write down my story. I want to be part of this. And I want to share with people in my life that I go to school with. I live near. I work with. Then I want you to take your story, a piece of paper, maybe you put a name on it. This is for everybody in the room. Just lift it up in the air. You're lifting this name to God right now, and I'm going to pray for you. Lift your sheets up. Dear Father, we take these names that we've written down, people we know in our lives that are pretty sure they don't know you or they're not following you, and we pray for them. God, we want to take the risk this year to point them to you. We can't do it without you. You are the one that draws people to yourself. So we lift this up. We lift up our story. Help us to write it down and know what our story is so we're ready to share with people. All right, you who are standing can take your seats. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.